I'm Ana, Sid, Rose, and Yuri. Our other colleague couldn't be here, um, Sundaria, but she helped us with everything here. Um, so quick shout out to her. Um, so thank you for coming to our presentation. L5 operator from zero to autopilot, exploring Kubernetes operator capability levels. So how many of you guys have heard about operators? Awesome. How many of you guys use operators? Cool. How many of you guys have made operators? Wow. Awesome. <laughs> so you guys can teach us, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, so operators, what are operators? Um, so we'll try it. It's hard. I think it's hard. Operators are hard, but we'll try to break it up um, and explain it as best as we can. So what is an operator? An operator can be thought of as a Kubernetes native application that extends the functionality of Kubernetes. So it's a pattern Kubernetes that uses custom resources and uh, controllers to manage applications in a cluster. And so a controller is a control loop that watches the state of the current cluster and tries to bring it closer to the desired state that we declare in our custom resource. And so right now, um, operators have, well, operators in general have different maturity levels, right? And so the capabilities can range from basic installation to complete autopilot, with autopilot being our goals for operators, right? We don't want to do anything. We just want to sit back and let it do everything for us. And let's see. And so in um, the operator framework um, explains what autopilot. Oh, it is. <laughs> the operator framework um, explains the capabilities models of operators really well. And so operator framework is an open source toolkit that is used to manage operators um, in a more effective, automated and scalable way. Um, like I said, operators come in lots of maturity levels. So this uh, framework really helps guide us as to what levels, um, what features each operator, what what features users can expect in each operator, right? And so the five levels are basic installation. Um, level two is seamless upgrades. Level three is full lifecycle, backup, restore. Level four is deep insights with metrics and alerts. And then level five is autopilot, meaning auto scale, auto heal, auto tune. And it's able to detect abnormalities and um, let us know about it if it deviates from the standard performance, right? It can automatically fix it or it can alert us um, to come and fix it. Um, so currently on Operator Hub, there's only 70% of operators that have level two capabilities and only 5% of operators that have level five capabilities. So in this presentation, uh, we're hoping to enable you guys to be able to create operator, operators with greater um, capabilities, as well as add more capabilities to any existing operators out there. OK, so first off, we're going to start with level one. Um, level one is basic installation, automated application provisioning and configuration management. So this is our operand, um, the application that um, our operator is created for. We're going to do a quick look at this. This was created with a React front end and a Flask back end with a Postgres database. It'll show up. <laughs> Can you just look oh. at the screenshot? Sure. Okay. Well, it's a really <laughs> cute little application um, for pad adoption here. And so um, for our operator, it's written in Golang. So it's a Golang based operator. We utilize operator SDK to um, orchestrate our operator. So it came with lots of things out of the box. Um, operator SDK is a framework that uses the control controller runtime library, which helps simplifies the building, testing, and packaging of operators. And then Operator SDK, um, you can also integrate it with Operator Lifecycle Manager, uh, OLLM, to help streamline the packaging, installing, and running of operators on a cluster. And also, um, Operator gives us a lot of stuff, right? So um, if you have a Go-based operator and in the cluster you have Prometheus Operator as well deployed on it, it sets up metrics for you automatically. And so to create our L5 operator into a level one um, capability, capability operator, um, we had to think about the requirements of our particular application and the desired state of our application. So we decided we needed the deployment, the service, the route ingress, um, the Postgres database, and a job. Um, for Postgres database, we used the Crunchy Postgres operator. Um, so it came with a lot of stuff out of the box too, and it did most of the heavy lifting for us. And for the job, um, we needed that to seed our database before our application ran. And this is just a quick diagram of all the things our application needed. Let's do, there you go. 
Um, yeah, so this is a quick diagram of all the things our application needed. Text is quite small, but it's deployment, ingress, the services, and secrets, and all of that. Um, and so next up is the custom resource. So here is um, a custom resource is an object that lets you extend Kubernetes right capabilities and adding um, any kind of API object that's useful for your particular application. So the custom kind um, that specifically pertains to our operand bestie application is the kind bestie. You see here we specify a size of three and we have the image in there and max replicas and the virgin. Um, virgin. <laughs> the virgin. Okay. So um, next up is the controller, right? So in our operator, we need the custom resource and the controller. So again, control loop, uh, controller watches our desired state and it um, tries to get, get it to our defined state in our custom resource, right? Okay, so once the controller is um, triggered, then it calls our, it does our reconcil re reconciler function, right? So here is a quick snippet of our reconcilers. We cut it up into little um, sub-reconcilers. So once an event occurs and something happens, then it goes through this reconcile function and goes through each sub-reconciler. You see the Postgres, uh, the seeding, the job seeding, the deployment, service, the horizontal pod autoscaler, and the routes. Then here we're going to do a quick demo to show you guys. Okay. Okay. Not presenting? No, no, she's just finding her mouth. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it. It's on the last one. Went to the last slide. Oh, it's, it's like ah, okay, it's so small. I'm like, where is it? So our operator is on Operator Hub. Um, so all you have to do is search it up on Operator Hub and L5 Operator, declare the namespace you want it installed in. And yeah, it'll start loading super fast. Just kidding, I fast forwarded it, so it's not that fast. <laughs> you might have to wait a bit. <laughs> um, but yeah, so after that, we're going to check and see if the operators are there. Our operator is dependent on Crunchy Postgres operator, and so you'll see um, that the Crunchy Postgres operator is there as well. And then we're going to check and see, um, see if everything's being installed right. Then you're going to see the Postgres pods being um, installed um, and are seeing the Postgres operators, I mean, Postgres pods, and then you'll see the job being um, processed. And then you'll also see that the job is only, um, the deployment is only processed after the job is done because we specify that in our reconcilers. And yeah, so yeah. So the job is completed and now the deployment is running and the job only goes once the Postgres cluster pods are all, all good and stuff, right? And so now we're gonna check and see everything is there and available. You see our services, our pods, our deployments, our replica sets and our routes. And then we're going to double check. We do have our route. And we're going to take that to the browser and take a look at our application. There's my mouth again. Yay, and it's there. So now we have level one capabilities. We're able to install our operator. Uh, We're able to install our operator. Um, level five operator now has level one capabilities. It has the controller and the CR, the custom resource, and it can automatically provision and configure all the resources that we need for our fast application upon installation. And so next up, Sid will be talking more about the capabilities of level two um, operators and how we brought level five operator from level one basic installation to level two seamless upgrades. Okay, take it off, Sid. <laughs> Thank you, Mana. So everyone, my name is Sid. I'm going to talk about level two and level three, since one of our speakers couldn't make it. Um, so what is level two? Level two is basically described by the operators framework as the capability of your operator to do sort of patch and minor upgrades uh, for both your operand and your operator. So why do, why do we say this? There's two layers here, right? There's the operand or our sort of Kubernetes native application that's managing our, our secondary application, which is SD. So the, the way that we roll out updates to the operator and the operator are slightly different. The operator um, sort of versioning is handled by the operator lifecycle manager. 
Um, so you know, when, whenever you uh, publish a new version of your operator, it gets rolled out to all the, the users or all the clusters that have this operator installed, and they can choose whether to allow the upgrade or not. Um, in this presentation, we'll be talking about the operand or our application and managing its uh, version. And we have sort of a theme for this level two and level three capabilities of the operator. <laughs> it's that it's basically a free lunch. Economists like to say that uh, there's no such thing as a free lunch, but uh, in Kubernetes, you get a lot of stuff for free. So we're kind of leveraging that in our operator um, to get our sort of first free lunch. Uh, our first free lunch is basically uh, our application uses a deployment to run the workload. And in order to deploy or roll out minor updates to it, all we have to do is update the deployment. Um, so when we're talking about operators, we have sort of a uh, custom resource, and our custom resources can be thought of as the interface that uh, we use to interact with our operator and application combination. And our interface exposes a few different parameters that we manipulate, so the deployment size, the version, uh, the image views. And that's how sort of in a simple way you can have the level two capability. Right? You, you basically get it for free. Um, continuing with the theme of the custom resource being the interface of our application operator, we also have a status field in our custom resource that shows us the current state of what's happening uh, to our application or operator. Um, the example here shows us that as soon as we update the version, it's going to show us, you know, a version being rolled out. So we can see that, you know, there's one new pod spun up with a new version, and uh, the other pods are going to come up as soon as, you know, the, the, as the deployment progresses. So all this is, you know, all well and good. Uh, we say level two seamless upgrades, but it's actually conditions apply. Uh, level two is seamless for minor versions where, you know, there's nothing fancy happening. And one of the scenarios where we could have a problem while rolling out an update is if there are sort of incompatible changes uh, between versions. So say we're ruling, uh, rolling out a new version, and that version applies some migrations to the database, this could potentially cause some disruption as the older versions are not compatible with this new database. And in order to handle this sort of situation, we need a little bit more sophistication. Uh, we need to get up to level three, basically, to kind of handle it you know, as seamlessly as possible. So that brings us to level three. Um, level three basically talks about more parts of the lifecycle, specifically backups and restores. So um, in order to sort of not be, um, have any disruption, there's a bit more orchestration to be done and we kind of build up to that as we go through the level three capability. Um, continuing on our theme of free lunch, this is our second free lunch. <laughs> We're uh, consuming the Postgres operator, and Postgres operator does level three for us, essentially. So um, how do we consume the Postgres operator? We'll look into that. But the Postgres operator um, is essentially a database as a service, but it's within our cluster. So it has, it's a very mature operator, and it can do all the things that you know, full-fledged Postgres cluster can do. It can auto-scale, it can do backups, it can do recoveries. And all of that is sort of managed by the Postgres operator. And our operator kind of consumes it. So we kind of use leverage it as, uh, and leverage its capabilities and kind of it levels up our operator's capabilities. So when we say consume the Postgres operator, there's sort of two parts to it. The first part, as Mana demonstrated, is that OLAM automatically installs it since the dependency and we kind of, we specified it as a dependency. And the second part is um, we kind of use it, so we kind of manipulate the custom resource that it's watching, and we get stuff out of it. So just to quickly walk through you know, what the process looks like, we have um, you know, an example of the Postgres cluster custom resource. Um, it's like any other custom resource. It has a spec, which has a whole bunch of options. We won't look at all the options. We'll just look, like, look at a subset of the options. Um, we're interested in backups. So um, in terms of backups, the Postgres operator is fully featured. It sets up right ahead logs for you, so you can do point in time recovery. Um, it sets up, uh, no, it, it can potentially do scheduled backups, can do on-demand backups, and it can transfer the backups offsite. It can do partial backups and full backups. 
and it can also define a retention policy so you don't you know fill up your storage and spend too much money in storage um so the example of a simple way to consume this functionality from the postgres operator is to add an annotation to this object and the way that works behind the scenes is that we use the the kubernetes client that's provided by controller runtime we fetch this object we edit it you know add this annotation as soon as we save changes we push that to the kubernetes api server an event is generated and the postgres operator is watching for all events that occur or you know changes that happen to this postgres cluster object and that's what triggers its reconciler and it goes ahead and does you know all the things necessary to make this backup happen so what about restores right that's the next part of the life cycle um, restores have a few issues um, and that kind of brings us back to what we were talking about at the end of level two um, restores have the potential of causing some disruption and one of the ways that this happens is during the process there might be some incompatibility between the application version and the database version so there's sort of many strategies to go about this um, one of them is you know always you know roll forward um, always make sure the next version is compatible uh, the database change is done by version two uh, is also compatible with version one um, Sometimes, you know, developers might complain saying, oh, we don't want to do this because it's extra work for us. We don't want to think about, you know, making sure things are compatible. We just want to do our changes. We want to, you know, have a high velocity, get the features out. So there's uh, sort of more ways to kind of run it, right? One of them is don't worry about the service disruption. <laughs> just take it, tell the users, wait, wait five minutes. We're going <laughs> to do a change and then, you know, let them get the new version. That's one way to do it. So if you go with this approach um, and say we want to roll back to an older version and there's sort of disruption involved, um, all we have to do is kind of use one of the many backup features or restore features that the Postgres operator has. And this is an example of how would you, how would you do, how you would do a point in time recovery. So it involves sort of manipulating the Postgres cluster object. So adding some information about, you know, what time you want to roll back to. And it's triggered by the editing the object, ad adding an annotation. This works exactly the same way as a simple backup. The Postgres operator sees this change. It triggers the reconciler, and it makes sure um, it does an in-place rollback, and it makes sure your database is rolled back to this timestamp that you specified. So this is kind of you know assuming that there will be disruption. But there's are, there are more ways to kind of avoid this disruption, right? The general approach would be you know, clone the existing database, spin up a new instance of the app, do disruptive operations. Once everything's good, you switch the traffic over. So this is sort of like the, the blue-green or the red-black style of deployment. And there's sort of many ways to go about it, and the operator can kind of do it for you. And the, the way that it would go about doing that is um, doing the, the, the same three steps, right? So it would uh, create a new Postgres cluster, um, and the Postgres operator has this feature where it can clone an existing database. So all we have to do is create another a Postgres custom resource, Postgres cluster custom resource, and specify the old database as a source. And then you know, the Postgres operator will go ahead and clone the database for you. So now we have a database. Um, the next step is to set up our new version of our, uh, our application. And our application refers to the Postgres database or the Postgres cluster object with a sort of predictable name. Uh, and that's how it knows to use the sort of older database. So as soon as you spin up this new bestie stack uh, with the specific name that matches with the database that we've just cloned, we have like a complete sort of copy of the application pointed to the old database. So at this point, some disruptive updates can happen. The users are still using the old version of the application. Um, everybody's happy kind of thing. And then once, uh, once you're happy with it, all you have to do is switch over the traffic. So this flow is kind of you know, common um, at this point, right? Everybody's doing it, but there's al always some sort of CI, CD tool chain or some sort of extra stuff, either manual steps or some sort of, um, sort of intervention required to make this go smoothly. And the advantage of using or packaging this with your application in your operator 
is that this would be available with through like a one-click experience through the operator hub. So you would go to the operator hub, as Mana demonstrated. You would click on L5 or you know, whatever your, app, or your operator is called. It would behave like an application. It would be installed in your cluster. It would be able to, uh, you know, you'd be able to interact with it using the custom resource and do a, have all these features out of the box as, a, as an end user. Um, that's all I have for level two and level three. So like we said, many free things. We just need to sort of put stuff together to essentially package it in a way that's easily consumable by um, end users. And that's kind of what we're kind of aiming for. Um, next up, we have Rose, and she's going to talk about level four. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Oop, it's loud. Um, Hey everyone, my name is Rose, and uh, I will be presenting level four. Let me get this. Let's see. Here you go. And so life is full of surprises, but for everything else, we have Prometheus and Grafana. At this point, as Manan and Sid uh, alluded to us, we already have a level three operator and we have seamless upgrades and full life cycle. If I can, yeah, there you go. So what else can we ask for? Well, a lot more. <laughs> so we have this guardrails built around deployment. So we'll never see if our upgrades are failing because we always have the um, a website running. So what we have to do is we have to manually when we upgrade, we have to manually figure out um, if the upgrade worked by looking at the pod status or actually opening up the, um, going to the website. Um, so we don't want to do that. We want to be able to um, know when our upgrade is not working. Uh, so for example, if somebody typed in a bad version or a bad image or an image in the repo is not, no longer working, we want to be able to know this. Um, with an alert or um, something on the dashboard, maybe with Grafana. So this brings us to level four, deep insights. And the definition for deep insight is metrics alert, log processing, and workload analysis. We're gonna be looking at metrics and alerts. So we want our operator to set up full monitoring and alerting for the operand we want to expose metrics about its health, about the operator's health, and we want to expose the health and performance metrics about the operand. And we want to aggregate all the metrics using Prometheus and visualize it using Grafana. So the next few slides, what we're going to do is we're going to learn, we're going to see how to expose metrics in the operator, and we're going to create alert rules, which we'll create alerts, and then we're gonna show a demo of how all this is uh, put together. Okay, expose met, uh, operator metrics. First thing you have to do is um, sort of like the kitchen sink things that we have to do, uh, administrative. We have to create a service monitor. We have to, um, first of all, service monitor describes the set of targets to be monitored by Prometheus. So. For Bestie Operator, we needed to create a service monitor for our operand. Does anybody know why we don't need to create a service monitor for the operator? And Manakana said it earlier, it's because the operator framework creates all that for us already. So there's already, when you build it with um, the operator SDK, you already have the service monitor turned on. Um, so another thing what I had to discover is that you need a service monitor within the namespace that you're monitoring the service. And uh, so those two things. The next thing, uh, here's an example of the service monitor that uh, is watching the bestie um, operand. And uh, pretty much the YAML manifest looks uh, same for every service monitor you want to create. The only difference is for the endpoint, that port, you want that name to match to the port name for um, your service. And then the selector match label has to match the service label. And 
Um, for this, I also we also need the operand to expose metrics. So I want to sh show you if I can do this. Where's my Where's my um Oh, good. Okay. And now, so the operand is exposing metrics from here. So this is live data. Um, and for best practice, we always want to prefix your metrics with the name of your operator. So in terms of when you're in Prometheus, it's easier to find the metrics. There you go. Another thing we have to do before we can actually work on the metrics is that we have to grant permission to Prometheus server. So op the operator framework uses CubeBuilder to scaffold the operator. So the metrics are protected by the cube RBAC proxy by default. So because of this, we need, it, we need to create a cluster role and we also need to create a cluster, um, cluster role binding. So we're binding the service account, which is called the Prometheus uh, KAS, in the OpenShift monitoring, to, uh, monitoring namespace. One more thing we need to do is we need to label the namespace that we want to scrape the metrics. So we need to set up two um, labels, one for the operator that we're scraping and then one for the operand we're scraping. And um, we need to add those in the namespaces, in the namespaces that we're scraping. So now we get to the fun part. This is the custom metrics that we want to expose. Um, in, in this part, first we have to declare the collectors as global variables because so we can use it everywhere in the uh, reconcile loop. Uh, we decided to create an application upgrade counter and then application upgrade failure. Uh, so there are four types of metrics. There's the counter, the gauge, the histogram, and the summary. We decided to play with counter and gauge. Uh, the application upgrade counter, is its value can only increase or reset to one. So it's like a counting code going up or it can reset it to, um, to zero. This one tracks the number of successful operand upgrades processed. The application upgrade failure is a gauge, and it's a number that can go up or down, or you can set the number to be whatever you want. In our case, we're tracking the pod image status. So when the pod status, status keeps cycling and it never reaches to the uh, complete status, we're looking at the waiting reason as to why. And if we see error image pull or image pull back uh, off, then we set the... Um, the failure state to one. To increment the counter, we use the ink method and we use the um, Prometheus client go uh, functions. And to set uh, a gauge, we use the set uh, method. So let's look at some live code. I always like to look at code. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, so here is our reconciler. Yeah. Better? Okay. Uh, so I'm looking for so this is our reconcile loop, and what I wanted to show you is we are tracking, sorry, I'm not good at working at this thing here. I wanna to go to the end. So when I was talking about how do we set the state when we see a, um, a status, a pod status that is one we don't want, uh, we can look into the Kubernetes um, I don't know how you call that, the Kubernetes uh, methods or something, and we can find out the status. And then we use that to 
to increment. I lost my. Oh, there you go. Okay. We use that to increment. Sorry. Okay, I'm terrible at driving this. <laughs> Maybe you can drive it for me. Let's see. I think we should just uh, yeah do, continue with the demo. Yeah, we should do that. Okay. And so, well, first I have to flip that thing. There you go. Go back to the demo. There you go. Okay. And all our code is in repo, so we can, uh, so you guys can go check it out. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is the Prometheus rule. And when we set up a rule, in this case, or we're setting the condition of the metrics, best the upgrade failure. If that, if that um, number is equal to one, then an alert will uh, pop up. So for live view of the, there you go. Okay, so we created a Grafana and the 52 number here is the counter. So we've created 52 times. And then when, when we have a, a failure state, we set the, we can set the, um, the color to red. And um, so that's how we're doing it. And I also have a Prometheus. There you go. Okay. Can't look. There you go, okay. Oh, well, we ran out of time. Okay, that was a Prometheus view of an alert. Um, so let me continue this with... Oh. There you go. I also have a, um, a demo here because I was afraid that things wasn't going to work. It didn't work, but um, you can see this uh, in our repo. And so lastly, metric for thoughts. What can we do next? Uh, we can also look at maybe the number of visitors from our operand and do something with that. Or we can find out what pages are viewed. And this is all the things that we might look at later. And what operation did the users do? Is it a search? Is it an update? And was it successful or failure? So all these metrics that we can do. And um, and yeah, um, and also how many pets were adopted and their labels. And so these are the things that we want to find out before something bad or something crashes. And this concludes the metrics and alerts. And now we'll have Yuri next talk about Five. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Yuri. Uh, yeah, we work together in our uh, Red Hat Operator Enablement team. And I'm going to show you the Lab 5 uh, that is called Autopilot. As Mana just uh, clarifying the first uh, the first level, uh, basically uh, the level five is yeah is defined when an operator is capable uh, to do a self healing, to move the workloads for or a better nodes, or yeah to restart uh, their operands, and so on. And then why we are trying to achieve uh, the autopilot. Uh, I'm currently a software engineer. My complete background is a SRE in the operations. I work it many times uh, yeah, to yeah, uh, uh, fix the, yeah, some broken operators. And, oh, sorry. And 
you deserve a good night. We deserve a good night because the dream works. <laughs> and yeah, we are expecting that our operator is capable uh, to read metrics. And uh, based on the metrics uh, that it consumed or exposed, uh, we sh uh, the operator should also be able to do an outscale. Uh, that means uh, the operator should have in place a horizontal pod out scale and yeah, scale up or scale down pods uh, based on the metrics. Move workloads also, because if we have a kind of a CPU uh, utilization or a deviation in our metrics, then the operator will move uh, the, those workloads for another nodes and restart the operands. The operands, uh, see the mana exemplified. We created a web application to to, uh, to clarify uh, the operand. Um, yeah, and then this there could be a web application. There could be a database. There could be a Prometheus instance. Yeah, and we have many yeah examples that we could create as a, a operand. Okay. Uh, to uh, exemplify our HPA, um, we decided to create a, a, a way to enable uh, this HPA by default. Then, uh, if we gonna create a CR called Bestie, this is basically our operand, and if you set a max replicas field with a value greater than zero, then the operator will understand that we have uh, to create an HPA, okay? Otherwise, uh, the HPA will not be in place. Then we provide it to the to the controller that this logic, uh, if the yeah the end user wants to enable or not uh, the HPA by default, okay? Uh, I brought this uh, HPA workflow. Uh, yeah, I. Yes, or I think that you already know it, uh, how the HPA works. But just to yeah, to bring back in the memory, we have our uh, CR, that CR deploys uh, a deployment and the deployment deploys a replica set, pods, and the pods uh, yeah, communicate with the kubelet and inside the kubelet, if I remember correctly, there is a C advisor. And the metric server actually collects the metrics uh, from the, the kubelet, and the horizontal pod out scaler reads uh, those metrics from the metric server and acts uh, as we should do. In our case, uh, we're gonna see one example uh, about HPA uh, performing the action based on the CPU utilization metric. Okay, uh, we have a demo. Uh, see, they have to slide to the right side. Or <laughs> yeah, let me. Sorry. Oh, okay. Let me here. I can't create operators, but I can slide uh, right at all. <laughs> uh, three fingers. Yeah. Not this, not this. This one, can I have bigger? Sorry? Bigger. Yeah, I'm right. Oh, let me, let me try it. Nope. Yeah, Anna. Just playing. Uh, sorry, uh, I can't do bigger, <laughs> but I'll try to explain. <laughs> uh, let me, yeah. Actually, I left the command uh, with uh, get HPA uh, minus W, yeah, just to check uh, the current replicas uh, in our operators. And the tab besides, I created a fake load generator, yeah, to simulate a CPU utilization, okay? I'm basically, yeah, I'm running a while through uh, against our uh, endpoint. And then in that uh, first tab on the left side, uh, you're gonna see step by step the HPA uh, uh, spawning new pods. And then actually I, I know that it's pretty small, 
but uh, we currently have uh, three replicas and yeah, when the, the HPA achieved the threshold is 30% by default, then we're gonna see five pods, okay? And yeah, after uh, that we see these five pods, uh, I will console the load, the fake load generator and the HPA will uh, delete this extra two pods. Uh, yeah, let's wait. I guess it's wrong, but let's see this. Yeah, three turning out uh, the five. <laughs> Just to prove that our operator is capable uh, to do the HPA. Uh, the difference uh, between that and uh, yeah, a usual uh, operator with the level one is we have the HPA in place. And then, uh, you don't need to create an extra HPA uh, manifest resource in your cluster. So then if you activate through the max replicas field, uh, be aware the HPA will perform the action based in your metrics. Okay, just to, to clarify uh, this point. Uh, so now we have uh, five replicas. <laughs> okay, let me just stop it because it's, yeah, it's pretty small. And what is it here no no let me go back to the presentation yeah so uh i brought this uh kind of warning uh at the first bullet regarding the api version uh i don't know if you are aware of the version 2 of the Outscaling. Uh, in this version 2, the outscaling is capable to read custom metrics. Okay. Uh, before it, uh, the outscaling uh, could read only CPU utilization and memory utilization. Okay. At the second bullet, I brought uh, a question regarding new ideas uh, because, yeah, we are talking about operators and the operators uh, have operands. And in our case of a web application, I yeah, wrote three options, request per second, HTTP error rate, but and number of restarts. But you can think about uh, your application and uh, design the metrics as Rose uh, explained to us uh, today. Okay, and the takeaways of our talk is yeah, basically doing a wrap up uh, of the yeah, five levels. Uh, the level five, the level one, ensure that the operator is able uh, to deploy uh, the operand application. Yuri, but it's quite clear uh, the operator should be able to do it. But you have to be aware the operator has operand, and the operator should be able to install it automatically. You don't have to do anything to uh, perform this installation. The operator should be able to do it. The second topic. The operator uh, should it yeah should be able also to perform seamless upgrade because sometimes uh, the operator can be able to uh, upgrade the operator but not the operand and uh, to achieve this level two the operator is able to upgrade both operator and the operand. I guess it's yeah it's quite clear and the backup and restore are in place. Yeah, uh, when we are talking about uh, stateful applications, this is really important uh, because once we have some issues in our operands, then uh, the operator is quite a, a important, uh, this is a quite an important task uh, to, to do a backup once we get this issue and restore in another, uh, yeah, spawn in another pod and so on. The fourth, uh, I just talked about custom metrics. Uh, yeah, the operator as well as the operands expose metrics. So then we have the controller, the manager of the operator, and we have the operands. Both uh, are able to expose metrics. Uh, I brought Prometheus uh, because, yeah, it's a well-known uh, tool, but you can use everything you want uh, regarding the yeah, to expose those metrics. And in the end, the operator is able uh, to outscale based on the application loop. 
This is the baseline uh, to achieve the level five uh, doing an outscale process, okay? But as we can uh, see, for the near future, we are proposing and we are working in our team too. When we start creating a new operator, we have to scaffold the project. And the first uh, challenge that we, we have in front of us is scaffold a L5 operator with all capabilities in place. Because it will be amazing if uh, you are using uh, an operator SDK when you start the project, then you will have all the capabilities in place. It's, uh, yeah, it's quite a dream. And the second bullet, uh, the operator will take action in autopilot mode based on what it learned from performance by baseline. We are talking about here artificial intelligence because the operator will learn uh, based on a, I don't know, data lake, and then based on this uh, performance baseline, okay, uh, you, I, I don't need to do a, a HPA anymore, or uh, sorry, not outscale my pods or scale down my pods. I have to, uh, to spawn five pods by default for the next uh, uh, CR because this is our baseline, okay? And then, is, yeah, if you are interested to contribute with the project, uh, I encourage you yeah, to help us in this uh, L5 operator demo GitHub, and I have a big thank you for you.